We begin the Christian year by uh, celebrating the holy season known as Advent. We're in the first Sunday of Advent and we're at the beginning of our new year in the Christian calendar. It begins with Advent. It is a time when we prepare ourselves for the coming of our Messiah. Advent means coming, or waiting, preparation, anticipation. We celebrate these days of Advent over the next four weeks in an expectation and preparation for Christ's arrival. Through the centuries, Christians have observed a time of waiting and expectation before celebrating the birth of the Savior at Christmas. So this season of Advent is a time for reflection and preparation. But the mood is not somber and sad as we might think of during Lent. The mood is joyful. Advent has been enriched by Christian tradition to reflect its distinctive Christian meaning. It proclaims the revelation of God's love as expressed in Christ's birth in an humble stable, his sacrificial death on the cross, and his victorious resurrection. It points to the hope of Christ's coming again as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Advent makes innkeepers of all of us, asking each of us to make room in our hearts for the arrival of Christ. Let us today prepare him room in our hearts, in our lives, in our homes, in our worship. Let us, through the great traditions of faith, join with the shepherds of Bethlehem, the wise men from the east, and the seekers throughout the ages to welcome the one who comes at Christmas. Let us at Christmas tide bring our gifts to him. And may the messages of our song be glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill to peoples everywhere. The next hymn this morning is Come the Long Expected Jesus, number 196 in the Holy <laughs> Attention, add variety, and point to the significance of the season or 
festival being celebrated. The traditional colors for Advent are purple, a color that signifies the sacred and spiritual fulfillment, or blue, which represents anticipation and promise. meaning of candles. We read in Isaiah 60 verses 2 through 3 that Isaiah prophesying the light the Messiah would bring to the world proclaimed, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord rises upon you. The lighting of candles has been part of religious worship for centuries. The Hebrews burn candles for eight days as part of their feast of lights. Light has been used by many religious groups to symbolize truth while the darkness of night has been the universal symbol for evil. Since Jesus was called the light of the world in the New Testament, the lighting of candles has become an important part of our Christian worship. Some early Christian leaders stated that the wax of altar candles represented the body of Christ, while the wick symbolized his soul and the flame portrayed his divine nature. Candles made from pure beeswax were used to signify Mary, since this wax comes from virgin bees. This has resulted in the practice of some churches to burn only beeswax candles upon the altar or the communion table. When Joseph and Mary presented Jesus in the temple, Simeon referred to the Christ child as a light to lighten the Gentiles. From this statement, church leaders have used candles to symbolize the light of Christ shining throughout a broken world. As we light these candles upon the communion table, we symbolize God, Emmanuel, God with us, whose transforming power heals the word of sin and evil, war and strife, stress and turmoil, suffering and despair. Jesus embodies hope and help for those held captive by oppression. His ministry guides us to personal peace and joy through the illumination of his message of the love of God. Our next hymn is I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. We're going to sing verse 1. <laughs> David. 
the pink candle is lighted on the third Sunday of the Advent season. This candle symbolizes joy. <coughs> its use goes back to the Latin church, which asked the worshipers to fast during this period of time. The Gospel of John speaks of Christ as the true light coming into the world. In communion of that coming, I'm sorry, in commemoration of that coming, we light candles for the four weeks leading to the Christmas and reflect on the coming of Christ. It is significant that the church has always used that language, the coming of Christ, because it speaks to a deep truth. Christ is coming. Christ is always coming, always entering, a troubled world, a wounded heart. And so we light the first candle, the candle of hope, and dare to express our longing for peace, for healing, and the well-being of all creation. Today is the candle of hope. We come together in the midst of a busy season to take a deep breath, to breathe in together the life of God gives to us, to listen to the beat of God's heart and the blessings and lessons this season brings to us. Each week of Advent, we will light this Advent wreath. With its light comes our prayers and our stories. The candle for the first week of Advent is the candle of hope. Today the flame of this candle reminds us of the hope that came into this world when Jesus was born and God humbled down to be with us. Jesus said, I came so that everyone would have life, life in all its fullness." Where have you seen God's gift of hope lately? Let us pray. We thank you, God, for wanting to bring fullness and hope into every life. We thank you for the hope you have brought to us. Help us be witnesses of the hope you bring, and help us shine the light of hope for those living in darkness. Amen. Our next hymn is Light the Advent Candle. <clears throat> we'll sing verse 1. <laughs> Transformation. 
Because the needles of the pine and fir trees appear not to die each season, the ancients saw them as signs of things that last forever. Isaiah tells us that there will be no end to the reign of the Messiah. Therefore, we hang this wreath of evergreens shaped in a circle, which in itself has no end, to signify that the kingdom of God, to which Christ so um, eloquently testified, is also without end and is realized wherever truth, justice, and peace, peace prevail. meaning of holly. Hear this reading from Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 through 6, the message version, an unexpected description of God's saving power. The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrappy plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause him, us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him, and people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pain he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he'd brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment, and that made us whole. Through his bruise, bruises, we are healed. We're all like sheep who wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way, and God has piled all our sins everything we've done wrong on him, on him. He was beaten, he was tortured, and he didn't say a word. Like a lamb taken to be slaughtered, and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Justice miscarried, and he was led off. And did anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought for his own welfare beaten bloody for the sins of my people. They buried him with the wicked, threw him in a grave with a rich man, even though he had never hurt a soul or said one word that wasn't true. Still, it was what God had in mind all along, to crush him with pain. The plan was that he give himself as an offering for sin so that he'd see life come from it, life, life and more life, and God's plan was deeply, will deeply prosper through him. For Christians, this passage from Isaiah reflects the suffering of Jesus on the cross and God's transformation of that event into the promise of life. In ancient times, holly and ivy were considered signs of Christ's passion. Their prickly leaves suggested the crown of thorns, the red berries, the blood of the Savior, and the bitter bark, the drink offered to Jesus on the cross. Our next hymn is The Holly and the Ivy. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 as printed in the back of your insert. <laughs>
There are many legends about how the Christmas tree originated. It is believed that Mark, Martin Luther was the first to bring a fir tree indoors. He illuminated with real candles to remind children of the light Christ brought into the world. Hessian soldiers who fought for the British during the Revolutionary War brought the Christmas tree custom to the, uh, to the United States. German, Austrian, and Scandinavian immigrants settling in Pennsylvania put up Christmas trees and decorated them with brightly colored fruits, nuts, and candy, and colored eggshells and candles. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, the light of the world, we light the Christmas tree. During this season of Advent, whenever you see a lighted Christmas tree, let it call to mind the one who brings light to our darkness, healing to our brokenness, and peace to all who receive him. The next hymn, Go Christmas tree also on behalf of your answer.
Legends have kept alive a love of the Christmas, Christmas plants and flowers. Favorite in the United States is the poinsettia, with its red, sharp, star-shaped flowers. <clears throat> in Mexico, poinsettias are called the flor de la noche buena, <clears throat> or the good night, the flower of the holy night, also known as Christmas Eve. The poinsettia plant was brought to the United States in 1828 by, by Dr. Joel Quintet our first ambassador to Mexico. A Mexican legend tells of a poor girl with no gift to offer Mary. She picked some flowering weeds along the roadside, and the moment she placed them before the Virgin Mary statue, they turned into a beautiful poinsettia plant. Our next hymn is Low of a Rose there Blooming, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> 